Today and next session, we're going to talk a little bit about host defenses against virus infections. And this is obviously a topic that could take an entire course. Some of you have taken immunology here. But we're going to look at it in the context of virus infection. And these are going to be important parts of what we consider later when we talk about how, to, how disease is generated, how to prevent disease, and so forth. Now, today we're going to consider intrinsic and innate defenses. And here is my view of defenses of the human host against virus infection. There are a series of brick walls that the viruses have to overcome in order to be successful at replicating in the host. And the first wall is called anatomical and chemical barriers. And we have talked about these last time when we talked about how viruses get into the host. We talked about the skin being dead, the outer layer being dead and not being able to be infected. Uh, we talked about mucus that clears away viruses from the respiratory mucosa, the fact that tears in your eye are, are washing away particulate matter, including viruses, low pH of the skin, and so forth. These are physical, anatomical, and chemical barriers, and they stop a lot of viruses at the onset. But even at this stage, and this is a theme I want you to pay attention to, even at this stage, there are viral antagonisms of all these barriers. And this is going to be something we see at every level of host defenses today and next time. You know, our, our immune system, which comprises all of these walls, is great. And if viruses weren't able to overcome aspects of it, they wouldn't be able to replicate, but they do. So even at the anatomical and chemical barriers, there are ways that viruses get around them. For example, the skin falls off and spreads virus infections, and viruses can get through the skin by cuts and scratches, mosquito bites, and so forth. So that is, was last time, anatomical and chemical barriers. Today I want to talk about intrinsic and innate immunity, the next two barriers which viruses have to overcome. And then next time, uh, acquired immunity in a separate discussion. Let's define intrinsic and innate immunity. Intrinsic is a defense that's always present in the uninfected cell. All right, so it typically doesn't have to be induced, although that's a bit of a, of a vague definition, because when we make these sorts of definitions, we make lots of assumptions. But let's just say intrinsic defenses are always present in the uninfected cell, so they're ready to take care of viruses when they come in. They include things like apoptosis, autophagy, uh, RNA silencing, and other antiviral proteins. I'll give you a couple of examples of intrinsic defenses today and how viruses can overcome them. The innate immune system has to be induced by infection. We'll talk about this as well. So part of the innate immune system is that viruses are sensed. There are molecules in the host cell that senses that there is a virus present, that there's something foreign. And the host then responds by making a variety of molecules and they have antiviral properties, as we will see. So that's the innate system has to be induced. And then next time we'll talk about the adapted, adaptive immune system, which is tailored to the pathogen. So, so far, none of these systems, intrinsic or innate, they're not really tailored to a specific virus. They, they inhibit most viruses. But the adaptive system, of course, antibodies and <coughs> T cells and B cells, they are tailored to the specific uh, pathogen. So let's start with a couple of examples of intrinsic defenses. One of them uh, is certainly present in plants and invertebrates, like insects. We're, we're not sure if this is operative in mammalian cells. RNA interference in a plant or an insect cell, what happens is here we have at the top a virus with an RNA genome. The virus comes into the cell and the DNA is released. In this case, it happens to be a double-stranded DNA. And that DNA is then chopped up by a cell enzyme aptly named DICER. It's chopped up into 21 nucleotide RNAs. And those RNAs then combine with a, ver a variety of other proteins uh, in the host cell. <clears throat> and this complex of protein, uh, the risk complex, then will recognize any new viral RNAs that are produced in the cell. They will bind to it, and they will bind to it by virtue of the, the small uh, single-stranded RNA that was produced from the original incoming genome. 
it's been made single-stranded in complex in this risk complex it then will uh, will specifically hybridize to a viral RNA and chop it up because this complex has enzymatic activity as well so this is an ancient uh, intrinsic defense present in plants and insects now in mammalian cells we certainly do have micro RNAs which are small RNAs processed from longer precursors that can silence gene activity. What we're not sure is whether incoming viral RNAs are chopped up by the uh, siRNA system and used to guide elimination of new input viruses. There is a lot of research going on to try and sort this out. A couple of papers were published a few years ago that results are controversial, so we're really not sure. It may be that RNA silencing is old. It was possibly one of the first defenses to emerge, to evolve many, many years ago. And then in multicellular organisms, other things took its place, like innate and adaptive immunity. But the jury's still out on that. Again, we don't know if, the, if this is present in mammals, but it's certainly pre present in plants and insects. Now in those cells, there are certainly countermeasures uh, that the viruses pull off to avoid this uh, pathway. For example, there are viral proteins that inactivate the, the uh, effectors of the RNAi response. There are other proteins that bind RNA to protect them from being chopped up. So at every level, there's an antagonism or a countermeasure. And I try and put that on every cell, on every slide, just to emphasize that. Here's an intrinsic defense that is present in mammalian cells. And it comprises an enzyme, actually a group of enzymes called ApoBex, and that stands for apolipoprotein B mRNA editing catalytic polypeptide. Don't have to remember that, just want you to know what the letters stand for. Apobex are deaminases. And they, what they do is they take a genome and change, they take the, the aminos off of certain bases. And so as a consequence, they change uh, C's into U's. They, these proteins have been called weapons of mass deamination, WMDs. Now here we have a cell producing a retrovirus. It's budding from the surface. This happens to be HIV-1. We'll talk about that later. So you hear we have a complete particle. And then this, this particle is infecting a new cell. And as you very well know, the genome is reverse transcribed and you get a double-stranded DNA copy in early in infection. Now, what ApoBec does, it is incorporated into the particle. These orange ovals are ApoBec proteins. They get incorporated into the particle. And then when the particle infects a new cell, after the DNA is made, when we have single-stranded DNA, that's shown on the right, lower right here, so here's the viral RNA, it's reverse transcribed to single-stranded DNA. At that point, the ApoBecs come into action, they change all the C's to U's. That's deamination. So when you take an amine group from the C, it makes it into a U. That's all you have to do to change between the two. And then when you make the second strand of DNA, the U is, of course, is copied to an A. So you basically get changes from G to A throughout the genome because that C was originally going to be copied into a G, but now it's a U, so it's copied into an A. The, the, the result is uh, most of the Cs in the viral DNA are changed to Us, or most of the Gs are changed to As, and it doesn't work anymore. It's mutated out of existence. So this is a clever strategy. The virus cannot replicate because too many bases have been changed. Now, you may ask, where, where is this protein and why isn't it preventing the AIDS epidemic? Well, because there's a countermeasure. And the countermeasure is a viral protein called VIF, V-I-F. And uh, V-I-F is the blue protein in the upper left. V-I-F is made from the HIV genome. And what it does in infected cells, it becomes part of a large complex that adds ubiquitin moieties to proteins. Now, if you don't know what ubiquitin does, when you add ubiquitin, which is a small protein, to a other protein, it targets it for degradation. So it's like a label put on a protein. And so here, VIF binds ApoBec3, in this case. It gets ubiquitinated, that's what the U's are, and then 
the ubiquitinated protein goes to a big protease called the proteasome. It's a huge uh, chopper, basically. It's a garbage disposal. It goes through that, and it is chopped up. So ubiquitination is targeting uh, ApoBec for destruction. So VIF is present in the HIV genome, and that's why HIV evades ApoBec. Now this little bit on the bottom here, where you're getting ApoBec incorporated into the particle, this was done with a VIF minus mutant. Is that probably your question, right? Right, good question. Is, are there any viruses that work with ApoBec? There, there may be, I'm not aware of any, but it would be interesting if they use them as a source of diversity, right? Now these, these proteins are in our cells and they have other roles in our cells as well. They generate other diversity as well. So this virus on the bottom where ApoBec is incorporated, that's because it lacks VIF. So VIF is an antagonist of ApoBec and that's why HIV can replicate because it, it just uh, doesn't have any effect from ApoBec. So that's an intrinsic defense and how it's overcome. Another interesting intrinsic defense is epigenetic silencing. Now remember, we have a cell and a DNA virus. This is, goes for DNA viruses only. DNA virus infects it. The viral DNA goes into the nucleus. And there, the cell says, wait a minute. This is not right. This DNA should not be here. I have my own cellular DNA. What is this doing here? And what it does is puts the DNA in what are called PML bodies. And this, this is a photomicrograph of nuclei stained blue. And in green are the PML bodies. And these are places where incoming DNA is put and silenced. That's what epigenetic silencing is. And what happens is the viral DNA comes in, let's say adenovirus DNA or herpes virus DNA. It is then chromatinized. What that means, it's wrapped up in, uh, nu in nucleosomes. Uh, they're wrapped around nucleosomes. And the nucleosomes, of course, are composed of histones. And here on the left, we have a comp what we call compacted chromatin. It's very tight and the transcriptional machinery can't access it. So it's silenced. That's what we mean by epigenetic silencing. Incoming viral DNA is put in these PML bodies and then it's rapidly chromatinized and silenced. The way chromatin is silenced is by deacetylating it. When chromatin, when acetyl residues are added to chromatins, those are the red flags here, by enzymes called histone acetylases, it opens up the chromatin so that the gene can be accessed and transcribed. So silencing involves taking the acetyl groups off of the chromatin, and then you have a configuration on the left. So viral DNA comes in the nucleus, it's rapidly chromatinized, and it is deacetylated so that it is silenced. This is a brilliant strategy, right? The incoming adenovirus DNA immediately turned off, so nothing is going to happen. So then you may ask me, how do we get adenovirus infections? Well, viruses overcome this too. Here are just some countermeasures. For example, human cytomegavirus, a protein called PP71, degrades a cell protein called DAX that is needed for histone deacetylation. So the DNA remains acetylated and transcriptionally active. Uh, another protein of uh, Epstein-Barr virus and a protein of adenovirus, they affect the, the uh, localization and synthesis of PML bodies. They actually antagonize the formation of these PMLs. So if a virus is successful, it, it is because it has overcome this epigenetic silencing by either interfering with histone deacetylation or the formation of the PML bodies themselves. Another intrinsic defense is apoptosis, programmed cell death. A virus infected cell will set triggers of various sorts that will cause cells to die. And here's a normal cell on the left. Uh, and when apoptosis begins, the nucleus, the nucleus starts to bleb. Uh, you get pieces of the cytoplasm coming off. These are called apoptotic bodies and eventually the cell dies. It is a program within our genome to kill ourselves. So if a virus infects a cell, this program is turned on, the cell dies, and the virus can't replicate. As we'll see later, the apoptotic bodies that come off of these infected cells are picked up by macrophages and dendritic cells, and they can sense whether there are viral proteins or nucleic acids in them, and in that way start to make innate defenses. So program cell death um, is another intrinsic defense, and yes, Viruses have antagonists, so apoptosis is a complicated pathway, and there are many ways to trigger it. 
We don't need to go into that in this course, but viruses of all sorts make antagonists at every step. Just think about it. Adenovirus needs to have a cell living for, let's say, at least a couple of days so it can make virus progeny. If the cell dies, that's no good. So the virus antagonizes programmed cell death so that it can make virus particles. And these are some of the known viral regulators of apoptosis. You don't have to write any of these down. Just know that this is a really important target. Here are different viruses that encode various uh, proteins that target different steps in apoptosis. You may know that, for example, the activation of caspases is, is important to turn on the apoptotic pathway. And there are viral inhibitors. For example, adenovirus inactivates a caspase, and that's how adenovirus stops apoptosis in its tracks. These are brilliant things to have evolved over the years, and it shows you the importance of this pathway. Very much like we talked about an antagonist of PKR, which is a cellular response to shut down translation. Again, here, uh, this important intrinsic defense is inhibited by a variety of viral gene products. Now, there is another uh, intrinsic defense, which is in the news lately, and you've probably heard about it. It's called CRISPR, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. This is an ancient defense system found in a lot of archaea and about half of the bacteria that we know of. And what happens is when these cells are infected by a virus, shown at the top here, the viral genome is chopped up into pieces and they are inserted into the genome of the cell. Uh, and you end up getting these long repeats of various virus sequences. You sort of have a history of the, all the virus infection that this cell has had. And of course, as this cell divides, it passes on these, these DNAs to the progeny cells and so forth. And as more and more infections occur, you have more and more of a record of previous infection in the form of these short pieces of DNA put in the genome. Now, these are transcribed into CRR, CRISPR RNAs, CRRNAs. These are processed into little stem loop containing molecules. And then when you are infected by that virus again, that short RNA together with a protein, which is called an effector complex, uh, binds the viral genome and chops it up. So this is an intrinsic defense because it's always there in the cell and it's used to defend against a variety of viruses. Now, um, why is it in the news? Because people have, used, have adapted this system to modify genes in mammalian cells. So you can modify any gene by making a short sequence and combining it with an effector protein and putting it into a cell, and you can chop it and fix it or excise it. And so there's a lot of controversy because this will enable us to not only edit somatic cells. So for example, one application I just learned of this morning, the medical center, people with a certain kind of retinopathy, you can take their cells and put in their eye gene using CRISPR and put them back in their eye and restore eyesight. The problem arises when you try and modify germ cells and you want to make kids with just blue eyes, for example. People are not really happy about that prospect, even though it, it should be possible soon. And so that's why there's a lot of controversy over it. But mark my words, there will be a Nobel Prize for this in the next five years, okay? Remember that. All right, question one. Intrinsic defenses are always present. Which of the following are included? Antibodies, T cells, epigenetic silencing, skin, mucus. All right, the answer is epigenetic silencing. So you may say, well, skin is always present. Yeah, it is always present. But <laughs> it's, skin is part of physical and chemical and anatomical defenses. It's a separate category. Um, I would say intrinsic defenses are mainly things that are inside of the cell and uh, are always present. So that would rule out skin. Some of you pick mucus and T cells and antibodies. So antibodies and T cells are part of adaptive responses, which are later, and mucus is also in the same category as skin. All right, let's talk about innate immunity. Next, following if a virus makes it through intrinsic defenses, it encounters the innate immune system. It's activated within minutes to hours after infection. And it is comprised of the following cytokines and a variety of sentinel cells, which include dendritic cells, macrophages, 
and K cells and a, a set of serum proteins called complement. So that is the innate immune system. And as we will see, the innate immune system is pretty good at eliminating viruses early on, even before you know they have infected you. But when it cannot, it collaborates with the adaptive immune system and says, hey, we can't handle this. We need your help. And then antibodies and T cells are made. So there's a nice crosstalk between the two, which we'll see next time. The really important question here is, how does the innate immune system get triggered? How does it know that there is a foreign virus infecting you? And this story began with fruit flies. And if you ever run into Sarah Palin, you can tell her this is why we have to work on flies, because uh, the innate immune system was discovered in fruit flies. You do know that Sarah Palin once was quoted as saying, why are we working on flies and worms? Why are we spending money on them? And this is one reason, there are many others as well. In 1980, two scientists in Germany, Nusslein Volhard and Rieschaus, were trying to figure out what controlled development in flies. And nowadays we know lots of genes that are involved, but they were doing mutagenesis of flies and looking for odd patterns of development. And they identified a gene that was involved in establishing the dorsal ventral axis. And Wieschaus was looking at the flies under a microscope. And they were all weird looking. And he called her over. And she looked at it and through the microscope. And she said, toll, which is German for like cool or far out, something like that. Das war ja toll. And that's what the gene was called, the toll gene. Uh, so now we call these toll-like receptors based on this. In 1996, uh, the, the toll gene was found to have a role in immunity of flies to microbes. So not only is it involved in development of the fly, but it's, it's involved in fly defense. And in 1997, they were identified in mammals. And these are one of the sensors of the innate immune system. It all began in a fly. So we call toll-like receptors, TLRs, or pattern recognition receptors, PRR, because they can recognize different things. Here on the upper left, is the structure of uh, different toll-like receptors. You can see there are quite a few numbered from one uh, through 10 or so. They have an extracellular domain, which consists of uh, many leucine-rich repeats put over and over together, transmembrane domain, and then they have a cytoplasmic domain called the tear domain. And on the right is the structure of the extracellular domain of toll-like receptor three, which is the fourth one from the left. You can see the leucine-rich repeats are each of those uh, yellow beta strands, if you will, and they form a curved molecule. And that molecule can bind to a variety of ligands, and those are shown uh, in this table. For example, um, here TLR2 recognizes viral protein. TLR4, another viral protein. But TLR3, 7, uh, 8, and 9, you can see recognize nucleic acids. Now you may wonder how, how a nucleic acid can say that you're distinct from a virus is distinct from a cell because we have RNAs and DNAs in us as well. But it turns out that the RNAs that are brought into cells uh, by viruses are different from the RNAs that are in our cell and these detectors can tell the difference. So let's see how this works. Some toll-like receptors are on the cell surface, and they can recognize viral proteins. So TLRs can bind to virus particles uh, and recognize them that way. Others uh, recognize RNA. And in this, this slide is a slide about recognizing RNA. You can see uh, double-stranded RNA can be recognized in the cytoplasm. So normally, we don't have double-stranded RNA in our cells. We have just single-stranded RNA. So when a double-stranded RNA comes in, it can be sensed uh, by proteins like PKR, which we talked about last time, or a protein in the cytoplasm called RIG-I. And when that double-stranded RNA is recognized by RIG-I, it starts a signaling pathway. And the end result of that is gene expression producing cytokines and interferons. The toll-like receptors uh, typically are the ones that, that detect nucleic acid are typically in the endosome. So here's an endosome. Remember, virus particles 
get taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Nucleic acid's in the endosome, and so TLRs 3, 7, 8, and 9 recognize var various uh, configurations of RNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded uh, RNAs, and even some DNAs as well. And again, this is a place where viral RNAs go during entry, so it's a good place to, to sense them. And when these toll-like receptors sense uh, these nucleic acids, they say, okay, this is foreign, this is not good. Again, they, do a, they in initiate a signaling pathway, which ends up in the production of, again, cytokines and interferons. And we're going to talk about what these cytokines and interferons are and, and what they do. So the bottom line here is that we have detectors, and these are just some of them in our cell, which will recognize uh, molecular patterns present in viral proteins and nucleic acids and say, this is foreign and it shouldn't be here. Even single-stranded RNAs can be recognized in the cytoplasm uh, because, for example, they may, they may lack caps. If they have a 5-prime phosphate, they're recognized as foreign because there's no, there's no molecule in the cytoplasm of an uninfected cell that has just a 5-prime phosphate. And so it's recognized as foreign, and you have the production of cytokines. DNA is also recognized by specific sensors. So here's a pathway for sensing DNA. Here's a DNA virus uh, that gets into a cell. And now, most of the DNA viruses we talked about send their genome to the nucleus. And uh, that's not shown on this slide, but there are certainly sensors of DNA in the nucleus. But this uh, sent particular sensor is in the cytoplasm, which we think is sensing DNA that leaks out of virus particles as they're transiting through the cytoplasm. And the sensor for DNA here is a protein called CGAS, uh, cyclic GAMP synthase. This is a very interesting enzyme that synthesizes CGAMP, cyclic GMP AMP. And here is shown on the right part of this slide. This is a molecule of AMP, and there's one phosphate there, and GMP, uh, another phosphate there. And the phosphates make this unusual cyclic structure, so cyclic GAMP. And so that's synthesized by CGAS when it, it senses uh, viral DNA, uh, and then this CGAS sensing, uh, the CGAS actually binds to an ER protein called Sting, and that initiates signaling, uh, which ends up uh, causing gene expression of cytokines and interferons in the nucleus. Very similar to what happens with the toll-like receptors when they detect a foreign uh, molecule as well. And this just happens to be cytoplasmic DNA. As I said, similar pathways probably are operative in the nucleus as well, which is where the viral DNAs mostly end up. But the end result, the output, is gene expression after sensing, and the genes that are produced encode cytokines, including interferons. As you might guess, sensing is modulated. For every sensor, we know many, many different kinds of antagonists. I just want to share one with you, just to give you a sense, because there's no point in you learning dozens of different antagonisms. Just be assured that at every step of all of these defenses, there is viral antagonism. And here's an interesting one, which is antagonizing uh, the, the, the sensing of viral proteins by toll-like receptor 2. Uh, this happens to be a protein produced by a herpes virus. It's called BPLF1. It's this little blue uh, oval here. So normally, um, when TLR2 senses viral protein binding on the cell surface, it initiates a signal transduction cascades. And, and these are all a variety of, of protein kinases that initiate a signaling cascade, which eventually results in the production of cytokines, just like the sensing that we've talked about so far. So these cytokines would then be inhibitory for virus replication. The viral protein uh, BPLF1 inhibits ubiquitination of these uh, portions of the signaling cascade. In this case, ubiquitination is actually required for their function. So I told you before that one function of ubiquitination, the addition of U to proteins, is to get them degraded. But ubiquitination n need not always cause degradation. Sometimes ubiquitination is needed for the function of a protein. So here, the function of this kinase, TRAF6, uh, and this, this complex here, requires ubiquitination. And in fact, the viral protein BPLF1 inhibits that ubiquitination. So the result is you don't get the production of cytokines in the infected cell. So the viral protein is directly antagonizing the signal transduction cascade that would other le otherwise lead to inhibitory cytokine production. So this is at the level of signaling, but there are inhibitors at every other level, at toll-like receptor sensing, rig eye sensing in the cytoplasm, 
and, and everything you can imagine. Next question, which of the following allow the innate immune system to distinguish microbes from self? Cytoplasmic helicases, a helicase would be like rig eye, and toll-like receptors, antibodies, apoptosis, apobec, all of the above. All right, 80% of you got the right answer, which is cytoplasmic helicases and toll-like receptors. These are the sensors of the innate immune system. Um, uh, antibodies are the adaptive, which comes after the innate immune system. Uh, Apobec is an intrinsic defense, which doesn't distinguish. It just acts directly uh, on DNA because it's packaged in virus particles. A major output of sensing, remember, a foreign nucleic acid or protein is sensed by toll-like receptors or helicases. The result is transcription of genes that encode cytokines. And one of the major classes of cytokines are the interferons. Interferons were discovered in 1957 by two investigators who found that if you took uh, influenza virus, which was inactivated, so it was no longer infectious, and you just added them to cells and you let them incubate for a day or so, then you took the supernatant of those cells, you, that supernatant would inhibit infection of another cell by, by infectious influenza virus. So they said there's something in, interfering with replication, so it was called interferon. And now we know that interferon is a set of proteins produced by virus-infected cells, can be the target cell that's infected, or a sentinel cell. Remember, sentinel cells are macrophages and dendritic cells and NK cells. Uh, and these, uh, will, these interferons lead to virus inhibition. So let's look at the bottom here. Here we have a, an epithelial layer. It could be your respiratory tract or your gastrointestinal tract. It's being infected by viruses. These infected cells will sense the virus present, and they will respond by making cytokines, the little red dots. And among those cytokines are interferons. And those interferons then bind to other cells uh, and turn on a pattern of antiviral resistance that we'll talk about in a moment. Now, here is a dendritic cell beneath the epithelial layer. Dendritic cells patrol all sorts of places in your body. They're in your skin, in your respiratory and gastrointestinal mucosa. They're constantly moving around looking for trouble and they sample things. They sample everything they come across and so if they sense some cytokine production from an epithelial sheet, they will home in there. Uh, they, they will they have receptors for the cytokines on their surfaces. They will make more cytokines to try and cure the infection. And eventually, they will go elsewhere, as you will see uh, in a few slides. So interferons are produced not only by the infected cells, but also by other cells in the innate immune system that then come to the infected area and try to, to cure the infection. We will talk about three different classes of interferons when we talk about virus infections, type 1, type 2, and type 3. And shown in this slide are the receptors for these different interferons on the surfaces of cells. So for example, the type 1 interferons, alpha, beta, they're called. The, the purple oblong molecule, that's the interferon binding to its receptor. Type 2 interferons, the interferon gammas are shown here. And type 3, the interferon lambdas in red. Each has a distinct receptor that engages the interferon. So not only are interferons produced in infected cells, but they're secreted and then they bind to receptors on either the same cell or neighboring cells, doesn't really matter. So we distinguish three different classes that have uh, different kinds of kinetics and they, they affect different viruses. So as I said earlier, interferon is produced very quickly after uh, infection of a cell, within minutes or hours, and then it's shut off. So there's an initial burst of interferon production. Um, and then the, the interferon comes out of the cell. So on the left, on the right part of this slide, at the very top, there's a little bit of a cell. So that is a cell that had been infected. The infection was sensed, say, by a toll-like receptor. And it's starting to make interferon, which are the purple molecules. Those interferon molecules come out. They bind to interferon receptors on another cell. And that other cell may be uninfected. So consider you get a respiratory infection. You have a few cells in the mucosa originally infected. Those cells are going to make interferon. And they're going to protect the neighboring cells from virus infection so the infection doesn't spread. So here we have interferon binding to its receptor. That binding 
initiates a signaling cascade through a variety of kinases, and the end result is the production in the nucleus of mRNAs encoding the interferon-stimulated genes, or the ISGs, what we call them. There are over a thousand ISGs, that is genes whose transcription, whose mRNA synthesis is stimulated by interferon, and they have different activities. And they, why are there over a thousand? Because some of them work in specific tissues, and some of them work against specific viruses. For example, there are a set of ISGs that inhibit plus strand RNA viruses only, and another set that inhibit minus strand RNA viruses. So we have accumulated an arsenal of over a thousand ISGs in our evolution as a result of insults from various viruses. Now, unfortunately, we don't, have, we don't know how most of these ISGs work. This is a relatively new area of research, and people are just trying to figure out what they're doing. But let me tell you about a couple of them because they're pretty neat. So here is a infected cell. We, we've infected a cell with an RNA virus. You can see it fusing at the surface, and the RNA is in the genome. The um, RNA is sensed by toll-like receptors, and this cell will make interferon, and the interferon will turn on the synthesis of ISGs. And what we have here in this cell is, in red, these are the various uh, different ISGs whose functions we know. Now, PKR, you may remember from a few lectures ago, this is actually an ISG. It's induced by interferon. PKR senses, it, it is induced by interferon, senses double-stranded RNA, is, an activa is activated, and then inhibits translation. So that's one PK, uh, ISG whose function we know. Um, two other interesting ISGs, OAS and RNA cell, oligoadenylate synthase. Uh, this is an enzyme that senses viral double-stranded RNA and then makes short oligo-A stretches. Those short pieces of poly-A essentially activate an RNA cell, which is an enzyme which then cuts up uh, the viral RNA. So it's a two-component system. Another well-known ISG is MX, which interferes with viral RNA replication, particularly influenza viruses. Uh, ISG-15 is a ubiquitin-like molecule. It's an ISG but it's ubiquitin-like. It's attached to proteins and targets them for degradation, just like ubiquitin. And then another interesting one uh, is viparin, with, which interferes with infection, the uptake of virus particles, and one called tetherin, which interferes with the release of budding viruses from cells. So let's take a look at a couple of these uh, in some detail. So here is tetherin. It's also called uh, CD137. And these are cells infected with HIV. Here is a budding HIV on the left, and you can see the particle is, is formed and the, the core has matured by proteolytic processing. But you can see these particles are all stuck on the cell surface because tetherin, which is this little blue molecule, is hanging on to the virus particle. So tetherin is an interesting transmembrane protein. It actually is hooked in the membrane in two places, and then the uh, separate tetherin molecules interact with each other, so they hold the viruses to the surface. I think you can see how the tetherin is basically tethering the virus particles to the cell surface. And eventually they get taken up again by endocytosis and degraded. Now again, you may ask, uh, what's the importance of this if we have an HIV epidemic? Why isn't tetherin working? What's the answer? There's an antagonist. That's always the answer. If you say it, an antagonist is probably right. So the antagonist is an HIV protein called VPU. VPU, a protein which basically binds to tetherin and keeps it in the cell so it doesn't get to the cell surface. So normally VPU is present in the infected cell, so tetherin is not an issue. It's completely neutralized. But you can make VPU negative viruses, right? You can mutate the genome, and, and that's what's shown on the bottom here. These are, this is a cell infected with a VPU negative HIV. Look, look at this, first in the, in the magnification, is just chains of HIV particles all linked up by tetherin. And they're massive chains of particles at the cell surface. These particles will never float away and infect another cell. So it's a good way to restrict viral infection. So that is really an interesting protein called tetherin. Here is one just discovered in the last uh, two years or so, which I think is really neat. And I wanted to tell you about it because it relates to the cap on messenger RNAs. It's called interferon-induced protein IFIT1, which stands for interferon-induced protein with tetratricopeptide repeats number one. All right, let's call it IFIT1. 
This protein, it, again, it's induced by interferon. It binds to cap structures that lack 2'O methylation. Now remember, mRNAs uh, in the cell and many viral mRNAs are capped by this unusual 5 prime 5 prime linkage at the 5 prime end. So there's the capping RNA. And in addition to the cap, uh, several positions are methylated. This, this uh, nitro position here and these two uh, O methylations uh, on the next basis. So this protein, IFIT1, binds RNAs that lack these two methyl groups, that methyl right there and that methyl right there. So a lot of viral RNAs do not have methyl groups here. Cellular RNAs are all methylated at these sites, so they don't have a problem with IFIT1. What does IFIT1 do? IFIT1 is this red protein. It's binding the cap. And because it's binding the cap, 4E cannot bind it, so translation can't occur. I'll remind you that EIF4E is the cap binding protein that normally brings in the 40S subunit. And if IFIT1 is bound, the viral RNA can't be translated. So a very nice way of inhibiting viral replication. You can't get translation. You're not going to get new virus particles. And this works against many viruses. So your question should be, how, does, how do viruses replicate when IFIT1 is around? And what's the answer? Antagonism. Antagonism. And there are many ways that viruses antagonize IFIT1. On the upper left, cap snatching. You may remember that influenza virus mRNAs are primed with a cap and a little bit of sequence from host cell mRNAs. Host cell mRNAs are 2 prime O methylated. So flu is resistant to IFIT1 because its, it's cap is methylated. Uh, another virus, bunyavirus, also does cap snatching, so that gets away from it as well. Some viruses encode a 2 prime O methyl transferase of their own. They say that my, my polymerase can't do this, so I'm going to carry another enzyme in with me, and they methylate the 2 prime O's on the cap, so they are not subject to IFIT1 uh, interference. Other viruses steal host methylases during production of cap mRNAs. They steal these methylases, put the methyl group on the RNA. They are resistant to IFIT1. You remember cap-independent translation, where we have picornaviruses with a VPG at the 5' end, so there's no cap, so no IFIT binding. Picornaviruses are all completely resistant to IFIT1. And finally, there's an interesting group of viruses, alpha viruses. An example uh, of an alpha, alpha virus would be chikungunya. These viruses are capped. They don't have 2 prime O methyls on their caps, but they do have this very neat RNA secondary structure right near the cap that prevents IFIT1 from binding. Really cool ways to get around this. All right, so those are just a couple of examples of ISGs. As I said, most, most of the thousand or so, we don't know how they work. It's an active area of investigation. Now, when your cells are producing interferon, you don't feel good typically. Interferon has deleterious effects. It turns on you know, over a thousand genes, which have serious properties that can injure cells. And most of our cells in us have interferon receptors, so when you get a virus infection, many cells can be churning out interferon. And if you give people interferon, you can treat a variety of virus infections by giving people interferon continuously, and these people do not like this therapy. Uh, they, they feel very badly after a, a few days of that, and they, they don't want to continue it. Interferon will cause fever, chills, nausea, malaise, and many other issues as well. And most virus infections, in fact, every virus infection results in the production of interferon, and that's one reason why flu-like symptoms are so common, because flu-like symptoms are fever, chills, nausea, malaise, which are caused by interferon. So when you get influenza, you're making interferon, you get fever, chills, nausea, malaise, and we call that a flu-like illness. But many other viruses do the same thing. Probably Zika virus will cause a, a flu-like illness initially. And that's again because you're making interferon, and it's the interferon that have these effects. And remember, these are soluble proteins. If you get a respiratory tract infection, you make interferons in the respiratory mucosa. Those get into your circulatory system and they go everywhere. So if you feel, you know, your head is, you're sleepy, you're not focusing in class and you have flu, that's because the interferons are going into your brain and doing 
odd things. So interferons can be good and they can be bad. Used to, we have many people globally who are infected with hepatitis C virus and the old treatment for that was to give interferon weekly and people did not like that whatsoever. Now we have new drugs. Okay, how do interferons limit virus replication? Interferons directly inhibit viral translation. Interferons induce toll-like receptors. Interferons induce ISGs. Interferons damage cells or none of the above. 81%, the right answer is they induce ISGs. So interferons themselves do nothing except induce ISGs. And so the interferon protein itself, you could mix it with a virus or a virus infected cell, would not have any direct uh, effect. It's got to it's got to induce an ISG. So that's a key point here. Interferons bind to receptors on cells and induce ISGs, and it's the ISG proteins that have antiviral uh, effects. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the soluble mediators of the innate immune response, the interferons. We'll talk a little bit about other cytokines in a moment. But I want to talk first about the sentinel cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and natural killer cells. These are all considered innate immune cells. Uh, here is on the left a dendritic cell. And it, it was discovered uh, here in New York City. And uh, it was called dendritic because of these projections that look sort of like dendrites from uh, neurons, beautiful cells. And on the right is an NK cell. And again, as I said, all of these cells are always patrolling your tissues. They're, right now, as you're sitting here, they are moving in and through you, th underneath your skin, in your on your mucosal surfaces. They're below the epithelial sheet. They're in your body cavities. Their job is to look for trouble. So for example, in your gut, they're, they're at those M cells, which are very thin, and they're sampling the gut lumen, what kinds of antigens are in there, and they constantly, and how do they tell if they're foreign? Well, they, we'll see about that in a moment, but they constantly sample to see if there's any, anything foreign going on. Here is the lumen of the intestine at the top with the little brush border, so that's the apical layer. These are viruses, and you know, the dendritic cells can sense if this is a virus-infected cell, they'll sense the cytokines being produced, or if the cells are breaking, they will pick up pieces of the broken cell which contain viral nucleic acids and proteins, and they can sense those. Uh, the same thing with other surfaces, epithelial surfaces, skin, eye, vagina. There, there are uh, dendritic cells patrolling them. Now what happens is when these dendritic cells pick up something, they don't know what it is. They can't tell. Um, they may produce some cytokines if it's the right ligand. So if it's a toll-like receptor ligand, the, the dendritic cells can make a burst of interferon, say, at the mucosal surface to try and help clear infection. But mostly what they do then is to go to the local lymph node. So here at the bottom is a, is a lymph node. You know, wherever you are in the body, there are local lymph nodes, right, that are pretty close to where you are talking about. So the, the uh, dendritic cell goes to the local lymph node, and there it talks to T cells. And it presents whatever they've found at the periphery and they say, is this foreign? And the T cell is able to provide an answer. And um, here on the lower right is this gorgeous photograph of a dendritic cell in green talking to a T cell, which is in blue. You can almost hear them talking. And these are, red, these are bl uh, blood vessels in red. Through, and this is within a lymph node. P people have figured out how to stain these cells so that we know which they are. So these are exchanging information. The dendritic cell and the T cell exchanges information. So that's what the dendritic cells do for, for a living. So let's take a bigger picture, a view of this. On the left, we have a mucosal epithelial monolayer. We have virus binding and infecting these cells. These cells will sense the presence of the virus as foreign. They will produce interferon and other cytokines. Uh, those will bind to the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell may also pick up packets of dead or dying cells. But in any case, the binding of cytokines or the, the uptake of uh, viral proteins or nucleic acids causes the dendritic cell to differentiate into a mature dendritic cell. And those are the ones that look like, uh, well, dendrites, if you will. Then those go into the local lymph node and they talk to the T cell. And if this is not a foreign protein, the T cell says go back to work and the dendritic cell leaves and that's the end of the story. But if it's a viral antigen, then the T cell starts to proliferate and eventually you'll get an adaptive response comprising antibodies 
and uh, various T cells, which we'll talk about next time. So you can see that's the link between the innate and the adaptive responses. If, if the dendritic cell isn't able to clear infection by producing cytokines, it will engage the help of the T cell. So here's a bigger picture of what happens to a dendritic cell. On the left is the immature dendritic cells. This is the kind that's patrolling your body surfaces and uh, luminal surfaces and so forth. It has all sorts of receptor. It's like a toolkit. It's got toe-like receptors on its surface. So if the infected cells are breaking open and releasing viral proteins, it's going to sense them. And it's going to run right to the um, lymph node, of course. It's also got cytokine receptors. So uh, if interferons are being produced, uh, these cells could make ISGs or they could make more interferon. It has inside of it endosomes, which can take peptides that it's pulled in from the exterior, viral peptides, and bind them to this MHC molecule, and it's going to use that to present it to the T cell. Now, when this DC either detects virus or virus protein, when it senses cytokines being produced from an infected cell, or dead and dying cells as a consequence of apoptosis or virus replication, activation and maturation occurs. So the DC goes from here to here, and this migrates into the lymph node. And these DCs now have MHC class two on their surface. MHC is major histocompatibility complex. It's a, a major protein for uh, communication within the immune system. So in, in the immature DC, the MHC protein is on the interior of an endosome, and it picks up uh, fragments of viral proteins that are coming in from the cell surface. Uh, and then the mature DC displays these peptides. Those peptides are shown in orange in the MHC class II molecule. And then in the lymph node, the dendritic cell will engage a naive T cell. And it will present the viral peptide, or whatever peptide it has, it need not be foreign, to the T cell in, in the context of the T cell receptor. And the T cell will either uh, do nothing or it will become activated and differentiate into an effector T cell. So if it's a foreign peptide, the T cell will freak out and start to divide and make all sorts of other things. But if this is domestic, if it's not foreign, um, the, uh, the t nothing will happen and the, and the dendritic cell will go back to work. And all this activation of the T cell by the viral peptide is accompanied by production of cytokines which help uh, mature the T cells. So again, all of this happens uh, in the lymph node. The other component I want to talk about, the other sentinel, is NK cells. And these are also cells that patrol your body, much like dendritic cells. But they do something different. They're looking for virus-infected cells, and they want to kill them. The DC is not necessarily going to kill them directly. It may make cytokines that affect that. But the NK cells want to cause apoptosis of a virus-infected cell. How does an NK detect a virus-infected cell? Here on the left, is an NK cell, and it has a variety of receptors on its surface, which are called activating and inhibitory receptors. And here on the right is a cell it's looking at. It may or may not be virus infected. So if this were a virus infected cell, uh, it's, these typically are producing uh, glycoproteins on the cell surface. That's that blue molecule there. The NK cell activating receptor will recognize the glycoprotein, and it will kill the infected cell. Often, Virus-infected cells have low levels of MHC molecules on their surface. So MHC molecules, as we'll see next time, are very important for saying that I'm an infected cell. It makes T cells go to them and kill them. And so viruses, of course, for viruses, that's not a good thing. So many virus infections downregulate the amount of surface MHC protein. NK cells can detect that. If they find a cell with low MHC, they will kill it because it's probably a virus-infected cell. So they use a combination of low MHC and the presence of viral glycoproteins on the surface to, to identify a target cell. And yes, there are viral modulators. There are tons of viral proteins that antagonize all aspects of uh, NK cell recognition and killing. It's truly amazing. And again, if there weren't, the viruses would not be here. They would be wiped out. Really remarkable. The other component of innate immunity is the complement proteins. This is a set of serum proteins. Uh, and what they do is they augment um, antimicrobial activities. And one example is shown here. There are actually several complement pathways. We're looking at the classical cascade here. 
And the complement system has a detector protein as well, very much like the toll-like receptors we talked about. These are soluble proteins in the blood. Here, C1Q is a detector. It can detect viral proteins, or it can detect uh, antibodies that are bound to viral proteins on the surface of the cell. So here, uh, under C1, we see this, this complex of detectors binding an antibody that's bound to a, a viral antigen on the cell surface. Uh, these C1Q molecules can also uh, detect and bind to virus particles. That detection has a number of consequences. Uh, first of all, when, when C1Q is bound to virus particles, those are then opsonized. That means they're taken up very rapidly by macrophages and the virus particles are destroyed. So you can look at them as being marked for uptake by macrophages. The second thing that happens is the binding of C1Q to either antibody or virus particles initiates a cascade of, vir of protein cleavages. All of these uh, arrows here represent a series of processing steps, which end up giving you uh, a molecule here called C3A, which causes inflammation. Inflammation is the influx of immune cells into an infected area. So these molecules of C3A are signals for other cells to come into the infected area. And finally, uh, this whole cascade results in the assembly of a what's called a membrane attack complex. And this basically pokes holes in the virus infected cell and kills it. A number of things can happen. Opsonization, inflammation, which means bringing in other cells, white blood cells to help clear, clear the infection and actually killing the infected cell. So that's what the complement system does. It works early in infection because these proteins are all present in your blood and they, if you have antibodies already to the pathogen, you, this can assist in clearing it, yes. And yes, there are antagonists of the complement pathway. There are viral proteins that antagonize at many of these steps. All right, our last question today, what is the main role of dendritic cells in viral defense? They destroy viral particles. They sense infected cells and produce interferons. They only instruct the adaptive response. They lyse virus-infected cells or all of the above. Wow, we've got a division of uh, answers here. So we have an equal number of B and C. So DCs, <laughs> DCs certainly do not only instruct the adaptive response. They do. That's an important part of what they do. Um, but they remember, they also sense infected cells uh, and um, produce interferons. The, the key here is only. So they don't only instruct the adaptive response. All right, so, so far we have, in talking about innate immunity, we've talked about how virus infections can be sensed. And as a consequence, you produce cytokines, which include interferons. These induce interferon-stimulated genes, and those have antiviral properties. Now, among the other cytokines that are produced as a consequence of sensing, these uh, cytokines and chemokines, which is another kind of a, a cytokine, basically, these have other effects besides inhibiting virus replication. And they're all related to what they're doing to mobilize your immune system. And this we call inflammation or the inflammatory response. All right, so if you have a virus infection and the infection is sensed by the innate system, cytokines and chemokines are produced, you will get what's called inflammation. And inflammation is redness, pain, heat, and swelling. And if you've ever had a bacterial infection of the skin, you know that each of these is present. In the, uh, in the Roman era, there was in, in a medical encyclopedist called Celsus. He wrote this multi-volume set of medical encyclopedias. Probably you wouldn't want to follow any of them today. But one thing he got right was this thing about inflammation, redness, pain, heat, and swelling. He called them rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor. Redness, pain, heat, and swelling. He said these are the four signs of inflammation. He had no idea what was causing it. We didn't know about bacteria or viruses back then, but he knew what inflammation was. And what is this caused by? Increased blood flow, increased capillary permeability, the incoming phagocytic cells, and tissue damage. So when you have an infection, Blood flow increases to try and deliver immune cells to an infected area. The capillaries become more permeable so that immune cells can come out of them and go into the surrounding infected tissues, including phagocytes. When you have a lot of phagocytes coming to an infected area, you get swelling. 
and you get pain as a consequence of that and also tissue damage. So this is what I mean by inflammation. This is the response to, uh, this is the consequence of an innate immune response. All these chemicals that are produced. Remember, we looked at all these signaling pathways. All the chemicals that are produced result in inflammation because they're mobilizing the immune system to try and clear the infection. So let's see how that works. There are three classes of cytokines uh, that we talk about. There's a pro-inflammatory group, and here are some members here. And these promote activation of white blood cells, lymphocytes and neutrophils, for example, to activate them and make them killers so that they can either destroy pathogens, in the case of bacteria, or virus-infected cells. There's also an anti-inflammatory response because you have to turn off the pro-inflammatory cytokine response, right? You don't want to have pro-inflammatory cytokines being produced continuously. You would be in a constant flu-like illness state. So we have uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines that suppress the pro-inflammatory response. And then we have chemokines like IL-8, and their main function is to recruit uh, immune cells to the infected area. You know, various neutrophils and so forth, uh, white blood cells, come to the infected area and take care of uh, the infection. Now, you may have a local virus infection. It can be in your gastrointestinal tract or your liver or skin. But these mediators, these chemokines and cytokines, are soluble. They get into your circulation. They go everywhere. So we say a localized viral infection produces global effects. And some of those are, are diagrammed on this lower left here. So you have a virus infection that is producing uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Those are eventually going to get into other places, including your brain. And that's what causes fever, fatigue, and sleepiness. Those cytokines getting in your brain, they're not supposed to be there, but that's a side effect of their activity. Now, uh, other effects are they go into the liver and they induce a series of proteins that in themselves have antimicrobial effects. They're called acute phase proteins, and they have side effects as well. Uh, another thing that happens is some of these cytokines go into your bone marrow, and they stimulate the production of precursors to lymphocytes. Because if you have a serious infection, you need to make more lymphocytes. You don't have enough that are circulating in you. So that the source of those, of course, is the bone marrow. And many of these cytokines go in there and stimulate the process of hematopoiesis. So again, these locali locally produced uh, chemokines and cytokines, they function locally, but they do enter the circulation and have uh, global effects. Many of the flu-like illness symptoms, as you can see here, are a consequence of these chemokines and cytokines going in places other than where the initial infection is. So let's, let's take a little closer look at how that happens. All of these cytokines and chemokines, they're soluble proteins, but they bind to receptors on the cell surface. So just as on the left is just an example of that. Here's a cytokine binding to its cell receptor, its cytokine receptor. You initiate a signal transduction cascade, and you have the synthesis of mRNAs in the nucleus. And what mRNAs are made depends on the particular cytokine, and their biological effects depend on the cytokine as well. So all of the cytokines that are made, there are many, many that we haven't talked about, bind to specific receptors and have very specific effects. Here on the right is an example of what a chemokine does. Let's say we have um, an infection in a particular area. Here's a blood vessel. So uh, inside this blood vessel are some uh, neutrophils, white blood cells that are involved in bacterial defenses. And they are flowing through your blood vessel, capillaries most likely. And there's an infection in the neighboring area. That infection is producing cytokines and chemokines. Among the chemokines produced is IL-8. This uh, is a chemoattractant for neutrophils. So these neutrophils will sense it. They will slow down and bind to the endothelium, which is shown as individual cells here. And then eventually they'll go through into the tissue. They come out of the blood vessel into the tissue, try to deal with the infection. Now on the bottom is a higher magnification of this interaction. You can see the neutrophil attaches to the endothelial cell by a variety of ligand receptor interactions. And it's all stimulated by the binding of IL-8, the chemokine to a chemokine receptor. And that this is a soluble protein, the IL-8. It tells the Neutrophil, there's something going on here. You need to slow down and come in. So that is what these chemokines are doing. 
And yes, there are countermeasures to cytokines and chemokines. For every one, there's something a virus encodes that uh, can antagonize it. We have viral proteins that interrupt the production of cytokines in cells, either the synthesis or the maturation of functional cytokines. We have viral proteins that interfere with the action. Viruses encode cytokine homologs that bind to the cytokine receptor but don't elicit the same signaling transduction pathway. These are decoys. They also encode soluble cytokine receptors that bind up cytokines that are produced and prevent them from working. And then there are also viral proteins that interfere with cytokine signaling. So a cytokine binds to a receptor. There's a signaling pathway. Viral proteins can interfere with that almost every step. This is evil almost, the way this has evolved to interfere with every step, but it tells you how important uh, this defense is. Now I want to end up with a thought that you need to carry, keep it in your head, that inflammation is good for a potent immune response. This recruitment of cells that we've been talking about uh, is good. And cytopathic viruses, viruses that kill cells, generally cause inflammation because they cause tissue damage. They break up the cells, the dendritic cells can sense them, they can produce cytokines, and you can get an influx of immune cells into the area. So these viruses that kill cells activate the innate response. And it's also why these virus genomes encode proteins that modulate uh, these early responses to try and get around uh, innate defenses. So these are viruses like adenoherpes and pox viruses. But many viruses uh, that we have talked about and which we will talk about do not stimulate inflammation. And these tend to be non-cytopathic viruses. They don't damage cells. You don't get a good innate response because if the cell isn't damaged, the DC is not gonna be picking up packets of uh, viral proteins and nucleic acids. And they're not gonna be able to coordinate with the adaptive response to make a robust antibody or cytotoxic T cell responses. So viruses that do not kill cells have a very different interaction with the immune system. They don't induce a good innate and adaptive response, and they typically cause persistent infections that last for a long time. And I want you to remember this because we're gonna talk about persistent infections in a, in a lecture of its own. And one of the reasons they exist is because the viruses are not cytopathic, they don't kill cells, they don't induce a good innate and adaptive response. So the lesson here is that the classic inflammatory response, the rubor, dolor, calor, tumor, is the communication of the innate and the adaptive immune response. And without an inflammatory response, you get a bad adaptive response uh, and you don't get clearance of infections. And this is one reason why uh, we put adjuvants in some vaccines, because many vaccines are inactive, inactivated. They're not replicating viruses. They don't kill cells, so you don't get inflammation, you don't get a good adaptive response. We put a chemical in the vaccines that basically is a toll-like receptor uh, ligand, which stimulates a good dendritic cell response, say. You get inflammation and you good, get good antibody responses. So remember, good innate responses lead to good uh, antibody and T cell responses. Here is a summary of what we've talked about today. We have infections of cells. They sense infection. They produce cytokines, among which are interferons that turn on an antiviral protein. These cytokines also recruit uh, dendritic cells, which are activated, matured, and go into the lymph node with what they have discovered and say, T cell, what is this? Is it foreign or not? And that leads to the adaptive immune response, and that's gonna be the subject of our next lecture after spring break, how the adaptive immune response develops uh, from the lymph node. And remember, my last word before you go off, all viruses must encode at least one antagonist of intrinsic and innate defenses from sensing to interferon production to signaling cytokines, chemokines, NK cells, DCs complement, uh, even the adaptive responses, which we will talk about next time, there are antagonists at each level. If a virus does not uh, encode an antagonist, it's gone.